Welcome to Antitrust Code by Concurrences. Concurrences is the leading antitrust database with over 30,000 articles on competition law. Concurrences is also the largest network of antitrust experts with lawyers, economists, enforcers, and academics in 85 countries. By listening to this podcast, you will learn the fundamentals of competition law and hear about the latest antitrust news thanks to our guests, the best experts in the antitrust world. Hello, and welcome to this Antitrust Code podcast. My name's Alastair Mordant. I'm a partner at Freshfields based in London. I'm also one of the co-editors and co-authors of a recent concurrence publication on joint ventures written by members of the Antitrust Section of the International Bar Association. In this podcast, I'll be talking about the book with two of my co-editors and co-authors, Andrea Hamilton, an antitrust partner at Millbank based in London, and Nico Huckinen, an antitrust partner at Frontier, based in Helsinki. Thank you both so much for joining this episode. Nico, I'll kick off with you if I may. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and why the topic of joint ventures and antitrust was chosen? Thanks, Alistair. Uh, That's an interesting point to start with. Uh, And I think a a topic that we were actually been thinking about for some time in in the working group. We have noted that, that, that the screening of regulatory filing obligations on a global basis is really something that antitrust practices and in-house teams are doing on a regular basis. That's really the one of the sort of key parts of our work that we are doing in in in, in, in cooperation with the M and A teams and the M and A lawyers, and really the parties to the transaction and and the M and A teams require typically as early as possible. And, understanding of what the processes for antitrust clearances and, and, and their timetables look like and, and and what, if any, are the possible substantive antitrust risks and how are those going to affect the deal timetable and the deal dynamics. And and when, when the question is of acquisitions of entire companies, you know, 100% of shareholder shareholding or full mergers, the task is really quite simple, uh, since in majority of jurisdictions, these kind of transactions are quite clearly and exclusively falling under the merger control regimes. So then you know that, okay, this is the deal structure. You go to the merger control in whatever jurisdiction globally, and then you will know what the time table, table roughly is to get the clearance and get the deal closed. And there's many like online tools and handbooks of good, good quality available with the help of which an experienced antitrust lawyer can quite easily analyze with sufficient certainty whether a filing for the deal of this type is needed or, or not. And also the sort of relevant theories of harm uh, are rather harmonized around the world when it comes to these transactions where where you look at mostly the sort of horizontal and vertical effects of, effects of the of the transaction and, and and combining the parties operations but then the task gets task gets much more complicated when there are more than one shareholder present in the post transaction ownership structure talking about sort of 50 50 joint ventures or several shareholders having equal stakes or then one majority shareholder and one or more minority shareholders. There can be shareholders agreements of different types that can affect the control rights in the in the in in the in the commonly owned company. There can be greenfield joint ventures or brownfield joint ventures, different setups. And regarding these sort of multi shareholder setups, the antitrust regimes in different jurisdictions are really quite different. The significant difference is in 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 how they are how they are approaching joint control situations and it can be really challenging to analyze whether the national antitrust rules in in a particular country uh apply to this transaction and whether it's merger control that it's exclusively the regime under which these setups are are reviewed or are there also other rules so substantive 
rules and, and rules related to the cooperation between companies that affect the uh, analysis at the time of forming the joint venture or or during the lifetime of the joint venture. And there's no common approach to, to joint ventures or joint shareholding situation in antitrust internationally, internationally and even the, the definition of joint venture lacks any harmonization. If you ask what is a joint venture from a lawyer in Helsinki, you might have one answer. And then if you have a, ask the same question of a Chinese lawyer, you might have another. And we notice this, this, this sort of a lack of kind of easily the, the available practical tools or handbooks that would really go a little bit deeper into the these questions related to joint ventures and 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 I see that that there's really a need for for a source that that antitrust lawyers can can turn to when when trying to analyze the the applicability of different uh, uh, antitrust regimes globally to to, to joint ventures and joint uh, or, or or multi shareholder setups. And that's when we started to think if the merger control working group would, would actually do something here. And we are representing, or there are representatives in the working group from from uh, tens of different countries and jurisdictions around the world. So we could put together a comparative practical handbook that really concretely helps to carry out these antitrust analysis related joint ventures and 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 thereby bring more certainty and predictability to M&A processes and thereby creating efficiency. So, so that's where this, this is sort of the thinking process where this, uh, this idea, idea kind of kicked off and, uh, and, 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 and here we are with, with, the, with an excellent book. Thanks Nico. It, it sounds very much within the sweet spot of the, the type of work that the antitrust section and the, the working group you referred to, which is the, the mergers working group within the section. Uh, tends to, to to focus on, um, you know, one it's a, an area where there may be some complexity, uh, and where there could be real value add from an international perspective to provide that sort of comparative um, t- t- type of of input to allow um, practitioners to, to to really get to grips with a particular area of the law. Maybe if I can turn to you, Andrea, and if maybe you could tell us, listen. The- about the book and in, in terms of how it approaches some of these issues that that Nico has has referenced and you know it's it's obviously a quite a complex product uh, sorry complex topic and you know, how did you go about trying to address these this type of topic in in the book yeah thank you Alistair and thank you Nico I think it's 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 exactly it's exactly what we were grappling with is that when we are looking at approaching joint ventures and creating a volume um, that is is doing something that there where there wasn't really something before, given the breadth of what joint ventures are and the antitrust issues that they raise, the question is, how do we do this in a way that will make it both accessible and digestible and also ensure sufficient coverage uh, of uh, the issues? And also make sure that there is really a, a good coverage with a number of jurisdictions uh, worldwide that really can highlight those different approaches. So what what we ultimately ended up doing and what's reflected in the book is basically it, it starts out with an analytical chapter showing overall what we found and some trends. But then there's a chapter for each jurisdiction and each chapter has three parts and this is consistent throughout the volume. And so to make it both you know consistent and covering off a number of, of points that practitioners and companies really need to to understand. The first section really deals with joint ventures and merger control. And that's essentially looking at whether or not a joint venture might need to be reported to competition authority and and be approved. This raises a number of of issues beyond just threshold, but also issues that are uniquely applicable to joint venture analysis, like looking at whether or not a joint venture would need to be a quote unquote full function or not in order to be notifiable. Um, when transactions might be notifiable, even when they don't have any nexus at all to a jurisdiction, which is the case, for instance, uh, in the EU and, and China. So after that first section, 
of each chapter. Then there's a second section, which then goes into the substantive analysis. And that basically is looking at, first of all, well, how are joint ventures analyzed from a substantive perspective, but also deals with the point of, well, if you don't have a joint venture that needs to be notified, it still needs to be analyzed. And what's the correct framework for doing that in a given jurisdiction? What's the legislation that applies? How are our issues like, for instance, spillover uh, addressed? A number of points that that are that are addressed that that can be complex in practice, and this enables a comparative approach. And then, of course, when you're looking at joint ventures, there are a number of issues that are going to be common uh, to the analysis, regardless of whether you have a notifiable joint venture or not. And for those issues that are common to basically both uh, analytical frameworks, we have a separate section, and that covers issues uh, like ancillary restraints, information exchange interlocking directorates, um, and also considers the international implications of joint ventures. For instance, do you look only at the jurisdiction where the JV is, or do you consider broader impacts as well? So the the objective and an approach, again, is to enable a comparative uh, analysis across a number of jurisdictions covering a number of, of quite complex topics. But of course, while that's helpful in and of itself, as with anything in legal analysis, it's always uh, best illustrated by actual facts. And so to that end, what we decided to do was to create a purely fictional case study that would run throughout the book. So uh, at the beginning of the book, we have the story of the uh, Hydrocell joint venture, and I won't spoil it all here, uh, but essentially it involves uh, a joint venture between two companies uh, in the automotive sector that are considering uh, a joint venture. Uh, to develop some innovative technologies. Um, and then the question is, is how is that analyzed uh, depending on what the companies want to do? So there are a number of questions that appear throughout the volume as well. And the objective is really, as mentioned, to have a, um, a comparative volume, uh, but also to really bring it to life uh, by having uh, a case study that runs throughout the entire how we tried to deal with the the complexity of the of the, the issues presented uh, and uh, really bring it together. That sounds fantastic. I really like the idea of a of a case study that, as you say, gets runs through the whole book and, and each of the the country chapters. Um, Nico, Andrea mentioned a number of a number of issues which are covered, and and obviously we can't. Uh, discuss all of them on on this podcast, but maybe you could pick up on on, on one that just to give us a flavour of how the, the the issue might have is it being addressed in in the book. Thanks, Alistair. There's quite many actually. These sort of critical or or key questions that that relate to to the to the the joint ventures and the notifiability. You could say whether well, local nexus is relevant. Is there a definition of control that's relevant, joint control or sole control? And and then one that was mentioned by Andrea already is the full functionality of, of the joint ventures, which is something that's and and very sort of a key uh, key starting point in the in the analysis of joint ventures in in the EU and for for EU lawyers both on a, on a sort of commission level as well as in 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 in, in member states. Are basically meaning that uh, that if uh, you know, it, it asks whether the the jointly controlled entity, the joint venture, will be an independent participant market, so whether it's only an sort of an extension of of an dependent uh, on its parent companies, such as a product production facility that only supplies the parents without any of its own market presence, and answer the, this question whether it's jo Full function joint venture or not, this is is basically defining whether the whether the JV needs to be notified under merger control rules to the Commission or 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 many of the member states, or whether it's falling under the substantive antitrust rules, which Andrea, as you just uh, heard, explained, wh whether you are analyzing it under the section one of the book or or section two of the book, so so. The virtual control or or the substantive analysis, and uh, and a really a key question in the analysis and really a commonplace to to start in the EU, but but then when you go outside of the EU, actually 
in you you go looking at the antitrust regimes in many of the EU member states, you notice that uh, that the full functionality doesn't play any role in the analysis. You you don't really see any 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 reference to the independency of the joint venture being cr created, and, and and so you can basically trust that if you if you if you make the analysis around the world based on the EU standards, you, 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 you wouldn't get it right. And actually of the 22 jurisdictions that we covered in the book, only eight excluded the non-full function joint ventures from the scope of merger control, whereas uh, 14, a clear majority, almost a double, required a, a merger notification also for non-full function joint ventures. So that's a good example of how uh, how big differences there may be in the approach to joint joint ventures in internationally. Thanks, Nico. And, and obviously, just to contrast the position with the EU, where you said that full functionality is it is a relevant consideration. So somewhere like China would be one of those fourteen where uh, full functionality does not determine the notifiability or otherwise of of a joint venture. And in, in other words, joint ventures that are, are non full function can can still be caught by the the merger regime and require a immersion notification. Uh, I'm sure there are, are, are plenty of other issues that if we had longer, we could uh, we could discuss. Um, but, but rather like Andrew, I don't want to give away everything that's in in the book. Um, so, so maybe we'll draw this discussion to a close and and thank you both very much indeed for your insights uh, on, on this fascinating topic. Uh, I, I hope our listeners uh, have also found uh, the discussion informative and 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 thank you to, to those who have been listening uh, if you'd like further information on the antitrust treatment of jvs then please do take a look at the book uh, also we're planning a further podcast on on this topic with a particular focus on the americas so please tune in for that and of course for other episodes of this antitrust code podcast which is your antitrust podcast. So thank you very much indeed. You listen to an episode of Antitrust Code by Concurrences. If you want to read more about this topic, check the Concurrences website, where you can find all relevant articles. Follow us on Twitter at Competition Loss and join the Concurrences group on LinkedIn to receive updates on our next podcast.